Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our Processing in Memory course. Today, we are going to talk about how to program processing in memory architectures, and in particular, how to program a general purpose processing in memory architecture, the AppMem uh, PIM architecture that we presented in uh, previous lectures. Remember that the system organization uh, consists of a host CPU that is connected to some uh, the DRAM DIMMs that um, uh, behave as, as the main memory of the system, and some PIM enabled memory, some PIM enabled DIMMs uh, from AppMem. Each of these uh, DIMMs contains eight or, or 16 chips, and inside each PIM chip, there are eight DRAM banks. Connected to each of the DRAM banks, we have a DRAM processing unit or DPU. Remember as well, that uh, internally inside each pin chip, there is a DDR4 interface for the host to access the data in the DRAM banks. And there is also a control and status interface for the host to communicate with the pipeline of the DPU. Uh, in the current generation of admin based pin systems, we have eight DRAM banks per chip. The, the size of these DRAM banks called NRAM is 64 megabytes. And um, in order, for the pipeline to access this uh, DRAM bank, there is a DMA engine. This way we can move instructions from the DRAM to the um, instruction memory or and operands uh, between the DRAM and the uh, scratchpad or WRAM. And here you can see the pipeline with 14 uh, pipeline stages. Um, in the current generation of this architecture, this is an in-order pipeline that can run at a frequency of up to 425 megahertz, and it's a fine-grained multi-threaded pipeline with 24 hardware threads. Remember as well that there are 14 pipeline stages in this pipeline. In this pipeline, we execute instructions from the uh, instruction uh, set architecture, the admin instruction set architecture that is a, a specific 32-bit ISA. Remember as well that it's possible to compile 64-bit uh, C code. If you want to uh, refresh uh, about the architecture of the uh, PIM, uh, admin PIM system, the DPUs, and, and also some micro benchmarking that we did uh, of this uh, PIM system, uh, remember that you can take a look at these uh, two lectures, lectures two and three delivered in this uh, edition of the course. So let's uh, start talking about how to program this uh, processing in memory system. Remember that uh, here in the admin based PIM system, we follow the accelerator model where admin DIMMs coexist with uh, conventional DIMMs. And the uh, integration of the admin DIMMs into the system uh, is seen as a loosely coupled accelerator. That means that we have to explicitly move data between the main processor, the, the host processor, and the accelerator that are the admin DIMMs. And we also have to explicitly launch a kernel onto the admin processors, the DPUs, and finally return the results to the uh, main memory of the CPU. And this resembles GPU computing, as we discussed um, in the corresponding lecture. And uh, <clears throat> if we have a system with a host processor or a system on a chip behaving as a or acting as a host processor, and we have uh, this PIM enabled memory, uh, the first thing, if we want to run uh, code in this uh, PIM accelerator, the first thing that the host CPU will have to do is to move data to the NRAM banks. After that, the uh, processor will, the host processor will transmit uh, DRAM processing command to the DPUs, and then the uh, execution of the DPU kernel can start on the DRAM processors, on the DPU. In the meantime, the host processor can continue uh, continuously check if the uh, data has already been processed on the memory side. And at that point, when the uh, kernel finishes on the, on the memory side, uh, the banks, the memory banks, the NRAM, uh, becomes again accessible to the host processor. We started to talk about uh, admin PIM programming a few uh, lectures ago when we uh, introduced, we started to talk about our first programming example, vector addition. Remember that in vector addition, what we do is the element-wise addition of two vectors, A and B, and uh, we obtain an output uh, vector C. Uh, inside the, in, or in the admin-based PIM system, the, the way that we are going to distribute the computation of this vector addition is by partitioning the input and the output arrays across the 
DPUs, the available DPUs, so in uh, equally sized chunks typically. And then inside each DPU, we will distribute the computation uh, among the available software threads that are called tasklets. Uh, the key reference to uh, programming the admin based PIN system is the SDK documentation where you can find the user manual or a programming guide. Uh, with uh, many details and, and everything, <clears throat> all the different uh, library calls and APIs that we are going to cover in today's lecture. From these uh, user manual and also from additional presentations and white papers, we extracted a series or in particular four general programming recommendations. The first one, execute on the DPU's portions of parallel code that are as long as possible. This makes sense because in the end, what we want to maximize or accelerate is the performance of our workload. And if this workload is uh, massively parallel, we can benefit more from the parallel hardware that the DPUs provide. The second general programming recommendation is to split the workload into independent data, block, data blocks which the DPUs operate on independently. This is going to be important because as we will see today, communication across DPUs, I mean, between DPUs is uh, quite costly. So if we can partition the workload in a way that the, each DPU gets assigned uh, independent data blocks, and they don't need to access data in other DPUs, the performance of our program will be uh, much higher. The next recommendation is to use as many working DPUs in the system as possible. Remember that in a uh, real uh, admin-based processing in memory system, we can have up to uh, 2,560 DPUs. So we have many DPUs and if we want to maximize the performance of our program, it makes sense to use as many DPUs as possible. And finally, uh, the fourth recommendation is to launch at least 11 tasklets per DPU. This is something, uh, this recommendation is based on the, uh, uh, the, the characteristics of the DPU pipeline. And we uh, indeed uh, double check uh, this uh, general programming recommendation with our uh, micro benchmarking experiments. We observe that the compute throughput of the pipeline uh, um, saturates at 11 tasks. So when we start the execution of a program that is going to make use of the PIM accelerator of the DPUs on the PIM enabled DIMMs, the first thing that we have to do in our program is to allocate DPUs. Remember that we have more than 2,500 DPUs in the system. So we have to allocate DPUs in order to uh, choose those DPUs or the number of DPUs that we want to use in our program. Uh, this is something that we are going to do with a library called DPU alloc that creates a DPU set, which is the a set of DPUs that we are going to use in our program. And here you can see the uh, syntax of this uh, DPU alloc. Here we indicate what's the number of DPUs that we want to use, and this is the generated uh, identifier of the DPU set. One question here is, can we allocate different DPU sets over the course of a program? Yes, we can, and we are going to show you an example next. Uh, but if we allocate uh, multiple DPU sets over the course of a program, we may also want to deallocate them. And that's something that we do using DPU free. But let's see this uh, example. The example is Needleman Bunch. In Needleman Bunch, we have to change the number of DPUs in the DPU set as the computation progresses. Why is that? Because in Needleman Bunch, we are generating a two dimensional uh, matrix. And the way we generate this uh, two dimensional matrix is going diagonal by diagonal or anti diagonal by anti diagonal. And the size of the diagonals changes as we uh, make progress in the uh, computation. So based on the size of the diagonal, we want to allocate more or less DPUs in our DPU set. So that's why in every iteration of the algorithm, when we start to compute each of the anti-diagonals of the two-dimensional matrix, we first deallocate or free the previously allocated DPU set, and then we allocate a new a set of the DPUs depending on how many DPUs we need to use in the, in, in the next iteration. So after having allocated the DPU set, we have to load the DPU binary into the instruction uh, RAM that uh, each DPU contains. And we use a library called uh, DPU load uh, 
to load a program in all DPUs of a DPU set. So uh, here uh, you can see this is the file where we have our binary, and this is the DPU load uh, operation that we uh, do to allocate this DPU binary into the instruction RAM of the DPUs in, the, in this DPU set. One question here is, is it possible to launch different kernels onto different DPUs? And yes, it's possible. And these can be useful, for example, to enable workloads with task level parallelism, or even different programs using different DPU sets. So essentially, we would need to allocate, maybe if we want to um, have task level parallelism inside a single program, we can allocate two different sets um, uh, or more, and then load different programs in these two different, uh, different DPU programs or DPU kernels in these two different DPU sets. OK, so after having allocated the DPU set, having loaded the program into the IRAM, now we have to move the input data from the main memory of the host processor to the PIM enabled memory. And also, after terminating the execution on the memory side, on the DPUs, we'll have to move the results from the NRAM banks, from the DPUs, to the host main memory. So, and that's what we are going to do using CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers. A CPU, DPU transfer is a data copy between main memory and the PIM enabled memory. A DPU, CPU transfer is the copy of results from the PIM enabled memory to the main memory. And um, as we are going to see, there are different types of transfers. It's possible to do uh, serial CPU, DPU, or DPU, CPU transfers where we are targeting a single DPU, just a single NRAM bank. There are parallel CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers. In this case, we target multiple DPUs or multiple NRAM banks at the same time. And there are uh, broadcast CPU, DPU transfers. In this case, we target multiple DPUs, but we are going to transfer a single buffer to all DPUs. Let's start talking about the serial transfers. There are two library calls, DPU copy to and DPU copy from. The first one to copy data to the DPUs, to the MRAM banks. The second one to retrieve results from the DPUs. And this is how the syntax of these um, serial transfers look. And in this particular case is for DPU copy to. Uh, we transfer a buffer from uh, to or from each DPU in the DPU set. And the first thing we have to use when we, um, uh, when we make use of this DPU copy to or DPU copy from is to indicate what's the uh, area or the memory area of the uh, NRAM that uh, we are going to access. So, and, and to do so, we use this DPU NRAM hit pointer name that uh, identifies the start of the NRAM range that can be freely accessed by applications. Observe that we don't need to allocate NRAM explicitly. Uh, also, observe here in the syntax that we have to uh, indicate what's the offset with the, within NRAM, starting from this uh, NRAM hit pointer. The pointer to the buffers in main memory that we are going to transfer from main memory to the PIM enabled memory and the size of these transfers. So this is for the serial transfers. Uh, remember that in the serial transfers, we are targeting a single DPU uh, every time, as you see here. In the parallel transfers, we push different buffers uh, to uh, or from a, set, a DPU set in one transfer. All buffers need to be of the same size. This is a limitation of the current implementation of the parallel transfers. And to uh, perform parallel transfers, we first need to prepare the transfer and then push them. And then in the, uh, when preparing the transfers, we have, to, uh, we have to indicate as well if uh, we want the transfer to the DPUs or from the DPUs. And this is how we um, first prepare the transfer here, indicating what's the pointer to main memory. Then in the push uh, um, uh, library call, we indicate the, the direction, in this case, is to the DPUs, the offset within NRAM, and the transfer size. 
And finally, we have the broadcast transfers. In this case, uh, we are targeting, we can target uh, multiple DPUs, uh, but there is only the possibility of copying from uh, CPU to DPU. So it's a new unidirectional operation, this DPU broadcast too. We transferred the same buffer to all DPUs in the DPU set. That's why, it, why it's called a, deep, a broadcast transfer. And this is how the uh, syntax of this DPU broadcast tool looks like. It, uh, notice that here we have the pointer to main memory and the uh, transfer size. So one uh, question that uh, you may be asking yourself is, is it possible to use different types of transfers in a program? Yes, it's possible and not only possible, but sometimes also necessary. For example, in this uh, select operator, a relational algebra operator, uh, where we essentially, what we are doing is filtering <clears throat> values of an input array. In this particular example, we are removing uh, even values. Uh, what we, do in a similar way as we do in the uh, vector addition um, uh, workload that we um, started the lecture with, what we do is uh, dividing the input array, array into equally sized chunks that can be transferred to different DPUs for computation. And because these buffers are of the, of the same size, we can use um, uh, parallel transfers. However, the output of the select operation will have different size depending on what are the values in the input array. And what that means is that the uh, size of the output in each DPU might change from DPU to DPU. And um, that's the reason why we have to use serial transfers for this particular workload, for the retrieve operation, the copy from DPU to CPU um, uh, of the uh, output results. Uh, these uh, CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers are also very important. It's also very important to understand how they work and how fast they can be, because we also need to use them for inter-DPU uh, communication. The reason is that there is no direct communication channel between DPUs, and all inter-DPU communication takes place via the host CPU using CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers. Uh, these uh, enable us to, or allow us to create different communication patterns depending on the characteristic of our workloads. For example, um, we have, we can have more uh, say simpler workloads where we just need to uh, merge partial results in the host processor to obtain uh, the final result. In this case, we only need to use DPU, CPU transfers for this inter-DPU communication. Imagine, for example, the case where we are uh, creating a histogram in uh, multiple DPUs at the same time, and after having computed local per DPU histograms, we send all these histograms, these subhistograms or local histograms to the main memory, and then we uh, have the CPU uh, performing a final reduction and obtaining the final histogram. Another possibility is to uh, use these inter-DPU communication over the host CPU to redistribute intermediate results for further computation. In this case, we need DPU to CPU transfers perform probably some computation on the CPU side and then uh, return uh, the intermediate results by using CPU, DPU transfers. Typical examples are iterative algorithms like graph processing algorithms where, for example, in a top-down approach, we generate some uh, frontier, output frontier at the end of each iteration of the algorithm. And in each DPU, we are creating only part of the frontier. So we have to send all these parts of the frontier to the CPU for the CPU to consolidate uh, the frontier and then redistribute it to the DPUs for the ne next uh, iteration of the algorithm. But now let's see how fast are these transfers because we have been uh, working on, the, on, on that. We created micro benchmarks uh, to obtain the sustained bandwidth of all types of CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers. And in particular, we ran two different experiments. In the first one, we target a single DPU. Uh, we use variable, variable uh, DP, CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfer sizes from eight bytes to 32 megabytes. In the second experiment, we target a, a whole run with 64 DPUs. Uh, and in this case, we transfer 32 megabytes from 
um, CPU to DPU and from DPU to CPU uh, for a set of uh, 1 to 64 mgram banks. We also run some preliminary experiments with more than one rank. And what we observe is that, it, is that in this case, it's possible to exploit channel level parallelism. Remember that the admin DIMMs, the, the PIM enabled DIMMs, are connected to the host processor using uh, several memory controllers and several channels. And that's the ch uh, channel level parallelism that we uh, can exploit when we target more than one rank in our data transfers. Uh, of course, uh, because the PIM enabled DIMMs are connected through the memory channel to the host processor. Uh, the DDR4 bandwidth bounds the maximum transfer bandwidth that we uh, will obtain. But the cost of these transfers should be amortized. And the way of doing it is by uh, enabling enough computation on the DPU side so that we can amortize the cost of these data transfers. OK, let's just start with the first set of, of experiments. As I said before, we <clears throat> change the data transfer size between 8 bytes and 32 megabytes. And here you can see the results sustain CPU, DPU bandwidth or DPU, CPU bandwidth for different data transfer sizes from 8 bytes to 32 megabytes. These are the results for uh, CPU, DPU transfers. This is for <clears throat> DPU, CPU transfers. And one key observation here is that larger CPU, DPU and DPU, CPU transfers between the host main memory and the NRAM banks results in higher uh, sustained bandwidth. We can also observe in the figure that at some point the bandwidth starts to saturate. In the second set of experiments, we target a, a whole rank. In this case, we measure the bandwidth, the sustained bandwidth for CPU, DPU transfers, serial, parallel, and broadcast, and the DPU, CPU transfers, in this case, serial and parallel. We change the number of DPUs with between 1 and 64. And in this plot, you're going to see the sustained CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU bandwidth for the different transfer, different types of transfers when changing the number of DPUs from 1 to 64, all in the same rank. These are the results for serial transfers. Remember that in serial transfers, we target only a single DPU every time. So if we are uh, issuing uh, serial transfers to 64 DPUs, these transfers happen one after the other sequentially. And that's the reason why the bandwidth remains flat. However, we see that when we increase the number of DPUs in the parallel transfers, we increase the sustained uh, bandwidth. So this sustained bandwidth uh, of parallel CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers increases with the number of DPUs inside a rank. Another observation here is the sustained bandwidth of CPU, DPU transfers is higher than the sustained bandwidth of parallel DPU, CPU transfers. The reason is that they are implemented in different ways in the admin runtime library. You can find uh, a few more details in the uh, paper that we wrote about the admin PIM architecture. The uh, key reason for this uh, small difference in the sustained bandwidth is that the um, uh, copy operation between CPU and DPU uses AVX write instructions that are asynchronous, while the copies from DPU to CPU use AVX read instructions, which are synchronous. And that's the reason why they cannot achieve um, the, the same uh, amount of uh, sustained bandwidth. Another observation as well for the uh, broadcast transfers, observe that we can uh, obtain um, more or higher uh, sustained uh, CPU, DPU bandwidth. The reason is that because in the broadcast transfers, we are transferring just a single buffer to all DPUs in the DPU set, it's possible to exploit higher temporal locality in the CPU cache hierarchy. And this, in the end, has a positive effect in the sustained bandwidth between the CPU main memory and the uh, NRAM banks. Another thing to uh, know and to take into account when using these uh, data transfers is that the library performs a transposition internally when we call these uh, data transfers. The reason for that is that DPUs need a different layout of the conventional horizontal layout that we normally have in uh, DRAM DIMMs. As you may know, in DRAM DIMMs, uh, we 
uh, distribute um, the, 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 the bits of a word across the available chips. For example, if we have eight chips in one rank, we uh, every uh, 64 bit word is uh, divided into um, uh, pieces of eight bits. And these eight bits, uh, these pieces of eight bits are mapped to the different chips. This is normally done in uh, this horizontal layout is normally useful in conventional DRAM because this allows us to maximize the bandwidth when we access memory, when we access uh, the DRAM rank. However, in the uh, admin system, DPUs need to have access to entire 64-bit uh, words. So we have to perform this transposition in each cache line before writing it to the um, uh, DPU's MRAM or uh, when reading uh, data from the, the MRAM and, and moving it to the CPU side, we have to perform this transposition internally in the, in the uh, and it's uh, uh, transparently uh, handled from, from programmer's perspective uh, in order to uh, make sure that every DPU has access to 64 uh, consecutive bits, 64 bit words. So if you want to experiment by yourself with the uh, uh, CPU, DPU, and DPU CPU transfers, you can access uh, micro benchmarks that we created for our measurements. So now we know how to allocate, how to how to allocate the DPU set, how to load the program uh, onto uh, uh, the the DPU's IRAM, uh, how to do these uh, transfers between the host main memory and the PIM enabled memory. Now it's time to launch the uh, DPU kernel, the program, the code that is going to run on the DPUs. To do so, we use this uh, DPU launch that launches a kernel on a DPU set. And there are uh, different ways, or there are two different ways of launching this kernel. The first one is synchronous. Uh, this means that the host uh, code, the, the host application is going to be suspended until the, until the DPU kernel finishes. And the second one is the um, asynchronous uh, uh, kernel launch where the control returns to the application and the CPU can continue doing the CPU threads can continue computing while waiting for the um, memory side to finish to terminate the DPU kernel. The only thing if we use uh, asynchronous kernel launches is that we will have to use uh, either this DPU sync or this DPU status to check the kernel completion. Why this uh, asynchronous execution can be useful? What does it enable? Some ideas uh, that I would like to share. First of all, uh, it enables us to, to use, uh, to have task level parallelism because uh, we could launch one kernel uh, on a DPU set and then return the control to the CPU thread and then the CPU thread launches a new uh, kernel, a different kernel, onto a different DPU set, so this way enabling task level parallelism, or also to enable concurrent heterogeneous computation on the CPUs and the DPUs. They might be working on either um, um, different inst data instances of the same pro uh, problem or different tasks uh, of the same program, but we can have uh, CP uh, CPU and DPUs computing and working at the same time. And one last question before we launch a kernel is how to pass parameters to the kernel. To do so, we can use serial and parallel transfers, and it's possible to pass uh, the input parameters uh, directly uh, to the scratchpad memory of the DPUs, to the uh, working RAM. Um, this is useful for input parameters and also for, also for some results. And here you see uh, an example of how to declare in the um, uh, DPU code, uh, how to declare some input arguments and also some uh, results. We have to use this host qualifier because even though these are going to be allocated in WRAM, we need them to be accessible by the host. So for example, if we want to transfer, we want to copy the input parameters, we need to use, uh, we can use either serial transfers or parallel transfers but we would need to use these DPU input arguments that identifies these input arguments that we have declared in the uh, DPU code. Okay, let's go back to our programming example, the vector addition. Remember that we are going to partition the input array, arrays equally and the output array equally uh, across the available DPUs and then 
uh, we are going to do a similar thing inside the DPU by assigning different chunks of the arrays to the uh, available tasklets. Let's take a look at uh, how the uh, DPU kernel for this vector addition looks like. Um, first of all, what we do is uh, obtaining the Tasklet ID for every single tasklet that runs on a DPU is possible to get one identifier, and we need to use this identifier to address memory and to access the NRAM in a proper way. Uh, this is the size of the vector tile that is uh, processed by this specific DPU. Notice that this is one of the input arguments that we have passed to the kernel. Uh, we need to uh, define what are the addresses in MRAM for the input arrays, in this case, arrays A and B. Uh, remember this uh, MRAM heap pointer, there is where array A starts uh, and um, some bytes later at the end of the uh, uh, array A, we find array B. We also need to allocate uh, memory space in WRAM. Uh, we are using there are, uh, three different ways of allocating WRAM. In particular, in this example, we are using memalloc, which is an incremental allocator. And here you can uh, uh, find the uh, main compute loop. Observe that uh, in this loop, there is a, uh, let's say, base index for each tasklet to access. We have to uh, check all the time that we don't go out of bounds and also uh, observe that after each iteration, we um, increase the, uh, the index by the number of tasklets times the uh, block size that each tasklet operates on in each iteration of this for loop. So when, uh, after doing some bound checking, the first thing to do is to load data from array A and from array B that they reside in NRAM into the WRAM. And to do so, we use the NRAM WRAM DMA transfers that are this NRAM read, where we can identify the addresses in NRAM, um, the uh, addresses in WRAM, in this case, cache A and cache B, and this is the size of the transfer. After that, we are going to call this uh, function here, vector addition, that is going to operate on the data that it has been moved to uh, cache B and cache A. We will see this uh, <clears throat> particular function in the next slide. And finally, after obtaining the result, we will transfer the result uh, from uh, the uh, WRAM to the MRAM, in this case, using a WRAM MRAM DMA transfer that is this uh, um, MRAM write. Uh, observe as well that in this case, the output uh, values, the output contents are in cache B because we are reusing this cache B to uh, uh, store also the result of the vector addition. And here you can see the uh, code for the vector addition itself. This is executed by each individual tasklet after having loaded chunks of A and B uh, into the WRAM. Uh, the tasklet will go over all the elements in these chunks A and B um, in WRAM and uh, performing the, uh, uh, the element-wise addition. Okay, so a few uh, considerations about tasklets. Tasklets are the software abstraction of a hardware thread, and each tasklet has, can have its own memory space in WRAM. You have seen how we can allocate uh, the, the, the space in WRAM for each tasklet using, for example, uh, this uh, memo, this incremental allocator. But tasklets can also share data in WRAM by sharing pointers. And that's possible, and we are going to see uh, one example next. Uh, but task, tasklets within the same DPU can also synchronize. So there are intra-DPU synchronization primitives, in particular mutual exclusion or mutexes that we can use to create critical sections, parts of the code where only a single tasklet um, can be in, and, and in order to avoid data races and ensure correct execution of the program. It's also possible to use uh, synchronization handshakes, another type of synchronization primitive. And in particular, these are useful to communicate from one tasklet to another tasklet. The second tasklet will be waiting for the first tasklet to finish to notify the second tasklet 
uh, we can use barriers. Barriers are a, a, um, uh, a way of uh, synchronizing all the uh, tasklets uh, uh, running on the same uh, DPU. And um, uh, what will happen is when, when one uh, tasklet reaches to this barrier weight, we'll have to wait until all other tasklets reach to the same point. And after that, they will resume the execution. And finally, we can use also uh, semaphores in cases where we uh, need to use, for example, a counter. This um, typically for producer consumer uh, uh, um, uh, patterns where we have, uh, for example, more than one consumer. So one example of how to use these uh, synchronization primitives we can find in uh, parallel reduction. In parallel reduction, we are going to have the tasklets in the DPU working together on a parallel reduction on obtaining one single value out of a whole array inside the tasklet, inside the DPU. What, so it's same as we do in, in, in vector addition, for example, we can partition uh, the input array into multiple chunks, assign each of these chunks to uh, each of the available DPUs, and then inside uh, the DPUs, we can further um, distribute this chunk across the available tasklets. For example, in this in this example, we have four different tasklets. The way that we are going to proceed is that first of all, because we have assigned one chunk of the input array to each tasklet, each tasklet can go over all the elements of its chunk and perform the reduction sequentially <clears throat> in order to obtain a local sum. So at the, uh, <clears throat> at the end of this uh, part of the parallel reduction, we will have multiple local sums, one per tasklet, that we have to further reuse in order to obtain the final local sum per DPU. So um, if we take a look at the code, we have this uh, for loop for the tasklets to go over the assign uh, the, the, the chunks in MRAM that uh, of this, the chunks of the input array in MRAM that have been assigned to each of them after performing some bound checking and loading the, 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 the piece of data or, or this a block of data loading it from MRAM to WRAM we perform the uh, reduction and accumulate in this uh, local count and uh, after uh, being done with this for loop. Uh, every single tasklet has a local sum. What they do is write in this local sum into some uh, memory location in WRAM. And this message array has been declared to be accessible by all the tasklets running on the DPU. So after that, we synchronize all tasklets using this barrier weight. And finally, we can have a single thread uh, reducing the uh, uh, local sums that have been written in this message array. So what this tasklet zero is going to do is going one by one over the local sums of each tasklet, accumulating them uh, in, um, in this uh, message zero. And at the end of this for loop, uh, we uh, write this message zero uh, to this um, output variable that can be uh, read by and accessed by the uh, host processor. So here you see the barrier synchronization and here the sequential accumulation that the uh, thread tasklet zero in this case uh, performs. But this last step could also be done in parallel by using a tree-based reduction. You can uh, here see how the very basic uh, naive mapping of uh, multiple threads, uh, or in this case threads, or multiple tasklets to perform a tree-based reduction. What we could do is uh, assigning to each of the active threads uh, two elements. So we are in the very beginning, we have one active thread, every two elements in the first iteration, these threads perform this um, addition and accumulate in some uh, temporary variable. Uh, in the next iteration, half of the threads retire and they, the active threads continue performing the local uh, sums and, and, and they continue until uh, as, as many iterations as needed. Usually, if we have an input array of n elements, we will need log n iterations. So this um, vector, tree-based vector reduction can also be implemented um, inside the DPU. And we can implement it in different ways. For example, we can implement it using barriers 
We can have multiple tasklets performing the tree base reduction after every iteration, tasklets synchronize uh, with a barrier and half of the tasklets retire at the end of an iteration. So you see after this barrier, after all tasklets have finished their uh, the, the, the local reduction and have a local sum, uh, we uh, uh, run, we execute this code for the tree based reduction based on the barrier. So you see that uh, in every iteration, we have uh, some tasklets that are, that are um, active and the active tasklets uh, uh, accumulate or add their own uh, local value that is uh, here in this message uh, array in WRAM and, and, and add the uh, corresponding value that was previously loaded, previously generated by another tasklet that is at a distance of uh, offset. And um, uh, after uh, each, at the end of each iteration, we make, we have this various synchronization to make sure that the remaining tasklets, the tasklets that will remain active in the next iteration will already find the corresponding values uh, or the necessary values in the message array. And one uh, uh, thing here is that in the next iteration, half of the threads retire because this offset um, is uh, multiplied by two, which makes that half of the threads retire. It's also possible to implement uh, the, this tree-based reduction in, in different ways. We also implemented it using handshakes and the code is uh, available in uh, our benchmark suite. Um, and, um, and yeah, and, 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 and the three different versions, single task barrier base and handshake base are compared in our paper. So if you want to learn more about the parallel reduction with this an extremely useful primitive for parallel programming, uh, you can also watch this uh, lecture about parallel reduction on uh, GPU that uh, we have actually covered this week in our uh, course on heterogeneous systems. So this is more or less all about this introduction to programming the admin based beam systems. Remember that a key reference for uh, programming the admin based PIN system is a programming guide or user, or user manual uh, user manual that you can find in the uh, SDK documentation. And we ourselves have uh, been working actively with this um, SDK and with this uh, uh, programming of the admin systems and have created our own set of workloads that we call uh, PRIM benchmarks. The goal of these spring benchmarks is to uh, provide a common set of workloads that can be useful uh, to evaluate the current PIM architecture, the current admin PIM architecture, to compare also software improvements and uh, compilers, and also to compare future PIM architectures and hardware. When creating these spring benchmarks, we um, adhere to two key selection criteria. The first one is to select workloads from different application domains. The second one is to um, implement workloads that are memory bound uh, on processor systems, on CPUs or GPUs, because that these uh, memory bound workloads are, let's say, the suitable candidates for processing in memory systems, at least in principle. So in total, the benchmark suite contains 14 different workloads and 16 different benchmarks, because for two of the workloads, we have two different uh, versions. And in this slide, you can see the whole list of workloads that are currently included in the print benchmark suite and their different application domains from dense and sparse linear algebra, databases, data analytics, graph processing, neural networks, bioinformatics, image processing, and parallel primitives. Uh, uh, as I said, it's not only the diversity of the workloads in terms of um, in terms of uh, domains or, or application fields is also that these workloads have been shown to be memory bound in processor centric systems. In particular, you can see here the roof line model uh, experiments that uh, we perform using Intel Advisor on a, an Intel Xeon CPU. And as you see, uh, all workloads, all 14 workloads fall uh, in the memory bound area of the roof line. But print benchmarks are also diverse in terms of memory access patterns. There you can find some workloads with sequential, stridet, and random access patterns. 
uh, type of computation pattern operations and data types that they uh, that they use and communication and synchronization patterns either in intra dpu or inter dpu in particular, if we talk about the inter-DPU communication, uh, we find some workloads that simply do this result merging that I mentioned before when I talk, when I talk about the uh, inter-DPU communication, like uh, workloads like select, unique, histogram, reduction, only need to use uh, DPU, CPU transfers to merge the final results. Uh, however, there are other workloads that needs to, need to use DPU, CPU, and CPU, DPU transfers to redistribute intermediate results. Examples here are um, um, the, the VBFS, one graph algorithm, MLP, a neural network, middle and bunch, which is a bioinformatics algorithm, et cetera. All print benchmarks, same as all the micro benchmarks that we generated as well, are publicly available and you can find them um, in this uh, repository. In upcoming lectures, we are going to continue talking about these print benchmarks and we are going to use them to understand understand even more the uh, admin uh, based pin systems and also to uh, um, to you know characterize the workloads and see uh, uh, like what are workload suitability characteristics. Uh, so what characteristics make a workload suitable for the admin uh, PIM architecture? And we, uh, in later lectures as well, continue talking about more real world PIM architectures and also about processing using memory architectures. So this is all for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Don't hesitate to contact me if you want to clarify anything related to this lecture or the course in general. See you in the next lecture.